Good evening, everybody, and very welcome to the um, webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to host uh, the Child Minding Difference webinar and to see so many of you coming in. Um, the, 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 the webinar is an idea that we've had in the Researching Early Childhood Education Collaborative for a number of months, and it's great pleasure to be sharing the hosting of the webinar with uh, Childminding Ireland. I just thought I'd say a few things about uh, the Researching Early Childhood Education Collaborative before we get down to the business of the evening. Um, we're a small, loose collaborative which emerged from a seminar back in 2015. And the objective really is to kind of create a, um, a space for linking people who are interested in early childhood education into the research that's happening, examples of good practice, and to raise issues that are of interest to uh, us across a variety of setting types. And over the years, we've held a number of seminars and symposia and so forth. Um, we haven't uh, had a seminar in a while, as you can imagine. The um, uh, last one we had was in November 2019, which was a, uh, a seminar we held to uh, celebrate 30 years of the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so it's great pleasure that we have one this year, uh, having missed out on last year. Before I, I go um, uh, on further with, with my um, presentation, can somebody let me know if I can be seen uh, on the screen into the chat? Yes, excellent. That's wonderful because I can't see me. So it's a little unnerving here to be speaking into a void. Uh, in any event, um, I, I'm thrilled that, the, that the, the sort of reactivation of the RECIC Symposia and Seminar Series is focusing on child minding. It's been an area that has been of interest to me for years as a parent many years ago, but in my, my um, work in early childhood education and care generally, uh, child minding has been the preferred option for many parents. It's also been uh, around for a very, very long period period of time and has grown over that time in its professionalism and in its service. Um, uh, however, despite growth in, in research in early childhood across the world uh, and in Ireland more recently, and despite increased investment and attention, the focus has tended to be on centre-based services and on services for children over the age of three. And so given that child minding is, is so um, available to families of very young children and also catering to children in school age childcare and has that kind of family and collective feel to it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the child minding, um, uh, so, excuse me, I've just had a message to say, you're going to get an email that's going to tell you that we've been delayed, but that's not, not a problem. We are no longer delayed. Uh, but the child minding has been a relatively invisible service. And so, it was a very exciting for me when a number of years ago, um, Miriam O'Regan, who you'll be hearing speaking later, came to, to, to talk to me about the possibility of research in this area. And it opened up my world to a whole field of research that I knew nothing about. And so we will be sharing that uh, uh, research with you this evening. Um, you will have had uh, a receipt of, of documentation in advance of this symposium or webinar rather. Uh, if if you've had a chance to read it, terrific. If not, don't worry, it'll certainly be referred to by our speakers um, and it will afford you a good basis to go back and, and, and kind of look at again once you've heard our speakers, if it's something you want to pursue. There are one or two housekeeping things I should uh, I should say today before we, we go any further. Um, the first is that the um, uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, I have had a number of apologies for people who can't make it this evening, uh, so I was delighted to be able to, to, to tell them that it would be available, um, but it also will be available to revisit and available for people who you feel might be interested and mightn't have heard about the webinar. Um, it'll be hosted on the TCD YouTube channel and should be up within a couple of days. So um, we're delighted um, 
uh, delighted to be able to say that. And then um, the second thing is to talk to you about participation. Um, it will be through questions and answers. And I'd like if you'd um, think about questions as you're listening to the two speakers and fire in the questions as succinctly and specifically as possible into the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen there. And um, we have people in the background here who will take the questions, collate them into a kind of theme uh, so that we can um, ensure that the panel discussion at the end of the webinar um, is, is, is answering the kind of questions that you want uh, to answer. We have fallback questions naturally enough, but it would be much more enriching if we were to get uh, questions directly from yourselves. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Bernadette Orbinski-Burke. Uh, Bernadette is um, the uh, CEO of, of Childminding Ireland. And Bernadette's background uh, is as a science and biology teacher uh, who retrained to become uh, a chartered um, accountant. And with those two uh, skills, went on to work in a variety of, of different areas. One of particular interest to those of us in Ireland in the field of uh, early childhood education and care was she worked for a while in the Scottish Department of Health. Um, and Bernadette has brought with her um, a knowledge and skills base which is really enriching and I think has added uh, considerably to the well-laid foundation that existed within Childminding Ireland. So Bernadette will speak a little bit about Childminding Ireland and she will introduce our first speaker, Bernadette. Thanks very much, Noreen. Um, so on behalf of Child, before I start, I should say apologies about my camera. It was working well all day and it's just decided to uh, play up now. So I'm very, very sorry about the quality of the camera, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll press on. So on behalf of Childminding Ireland, the national body for Childminding Ireland, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the webinar this evening. Um, as Noreen was saying, it's a joint endeavour between Childminding Ireland uh, Professor Noreen Hayes of uh, Trinity College Dublin, who was just speaking to you. Uh, Professor Holly um, Tonyan of California State University, Northridge, and Dr. Miriam O'Regan from the Technological University, Dublin. So it's widely acknowledged that home-based childminding is different from other forms of early childhood services. And from the flyer that was distributed um, advertising this webinar, there were two questions raised. How can that difference be described and developed? And secondly, what difference does childminding make to the experiences of young children and their families? These are very pertinent questions, particularly at this time of change in the childminding sector. As many of you will know, the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth the DCE DIY in April of this year published a national action plan for childminding. Um, the action plan. The action plan sets out a pathway for the registration and regulation of childminding in Ireland. So, just to give you some background to the evening, historically the sector has been unregulated with only around 77 of the tens of thousands of childminders in the country registering with TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency. It's really important to stress that unless childminders are minding four or more preschool children or seven or more school aged children, there is currently no pathway for childminders to become registered with TUSLA. In addition, it's widely accepted that the current system of regulation is not designed for nor is it suitable for childminders. In summary, not being registered with TUSLA does not equate to poor quality. So many childminders are doing a fantastic job of caring for children from babyhood through national school and often into secondary school. This model of care is often described as an extended family model with childminders and families remaining close long after the children have stopped attending the setting. 
the continuity of care, the small group sizes, and the availability of childminding makes it a natural fit for the estimated 88,000 children in Ireland. The importance of child safeguarding and the need for parental access to state childcare subsidies means that registration and regulation is necessary. The action plan is to be developed over the next eight years and outline steps towards regulation support and subsidies for all paid non-relative childminders. The aim of the action plan is to provide greater recognition for childminding and to support childminders in their work of providing high quality childcare. The action plan also aims to support parental choice and to increase the availability of flexible and affordable childcare for working parents. The action plan has been designed in three phases, preparatory, transition and full implementation. And we're currently in the preparatory phase. Child mining specific regulations will be developed, as will training programmes. Options for child mining supports will be examined and supports will be made available for child minders who meet current requirements to register and wish to participate in the national childcare scheme. An engagement, consultation, communication strategy will be developed. A huge volume of work is beginning and the success of the action plan will mean benefits for child minders, children and families. However, success is dependent on child minding input. So all of you child minders attending tonight, we're calling on you to ensure that you engage and make your voices heard. You are the experts on child minding. To the policy makers, as advocates for childminding, we at Childminding Ireland are here tonight asking that you really listen to childminders and those proximate to childminding. Please don't be tempted to believe that practices and resources developed for another model of childcare can be tweaked for childminding. Childminding needs to be carefully considered in its own right. The importance of protecting childminding and the benefits it provides to children and families cannot be overstated. In order to protect it, we have to fully understand it and be able to define the difference that is childminding. So with all that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Holly Tom Yan from California State University, Northridge. You're very welcome, Holly. And Holly is well known for her research exploring quality and family child care in California. And in her presentation tonight, Holly will be talking on a role for child minding in a robust ECE. So over to you, Holly. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bernadette. What a pleasure to be able to be here and connect with all of you technologically, all the way from California to Ireland. How delightful. And Bernadette, it's so wonderful to hear you describe the importance of honoring and respecting child minding at the beginning stages of preparing um, a regulatory system. So let me get my slides together so that I can share those with you. Oh, and my coworkers. Leah and Tommy are probably going to chime in periodically in this world of working from home. So I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of my conclusions from my research um, and from the time that I've spent looking into what we call in the United States family child care um, to look at child minding. So if I forget and call it child care, family child care, um, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, so here's what I plan to talk about during my brief stay with you. To be able to talk about building systems that support care where children and family are, building systems that support excellence across settings, the role of activities in building systems for children and families, 
and building systems that support children, families, and caregivers across the lifespan. So let's start with the big picture. I believe that in terms of good policies, good research, good thinking, it's really important to start with the right questions. Who is providing care for children and where does it happen? So I've developed this pyramid for thinking about how to design policies that target all of the many people who are caring for children and to match policies to the audience. So for example, many, many people around the world are caring for children. And so we can think of this bottom layer of the pyramid as all people caring for any child. All right, hold on a second, I'm gonna mute myself. I'll try that again. So all people caring for any child. And then we can think about what are the policies that we want to direct for people who are caring for a child with no prior relationship, right? Because there are some messages we want everyone to know about caring for children. There are some messages that might be more important as soon as someone starts to care for a child that they didn't know, because then you don't have relationships to fall back on in terms of figuring out how to communicate and how to negotiate caring for someone else's child. Just checking the chat. Oh. <laughs> um, as soon as people get paid, then we start to talk about people who are part of a workforce. And so then we can think about who are the people caring for children who do so regularly and for pay? And then who are the people who are engaging in this work as a profession? In my work, I've found that a lot of the people who engage in what we call family childcare um, often start because they're not happy with the childcare options that are available for their child when their child is born. Or um, lots of different um, reasons that people end up entering into family childcare, but some people decide that this is a profession and it's something that they want to keep doing and some people start out with um, family child care, and I would imagine in child minding, thinking of this as a long-term professional choice. But we don't want to design systems mostly for people who are doing this as a profession, because caregiving work often is something that um, is specific to people's phase in life when they have young children or when they're retiring. Um, and so we want to think flexibly about who are the caregivers. In addition, we want to think about where the care happens. And I encourage us to not confuse the what in caregiving with the where. Um, many regulations and policies can be based on the specific features of centers if we're not mindfully thinking about the what of actual caregiving. Um, and so I encourage you all in Ireland as you're designing a system for child mining to focus on what's distinctive about working in a home. And one distinction that I've found really helpful based on the work that I've been doing is um, to think of centers as mostly single purpose spaces, spaces that have limited functions and where the care is arranged for children of limited ages, as opposed to homes where homes are serving multiple purposes. They have varied functions for learning, play, eating and sleeping, and they're often designed for multiple age groups. And so it can be really important to think about designing regulations that don't confound or mix up the features of the setting with the features of the activities that really matter for children and caregivers. So let's look into that a little bit more. So this picture up here that I could find with licensing, you know, maybe not my ideal picture of a center, but we can ask, is this a single or a multi-purpose setting? You can see that this is a feature where almost all of the children are around the same size. They're about one age group. 
And often age segregated settings are based on about 12 months in a whole lifespan, which is actually a really narrow part of human development. They have this distinctive feature of child size furniture. And in the United States, we have this key measure of quality, the early, the environment rating scales that's been used widely. And they use child sized furniture as an index of quality. But child sized furniture isn't such a great indicator of quality in a mixed age setting. Um, Single purpose settings tend to be organized more around children's needs and then often center directors have to create spaces for adults to meet adults needs within those spaces that are often organized around the children's needs, as you see in this picture here. So these together ref reflect more of a single purpose space as opposed to a multi purpose setting. And if we look at some alternative pictures, in this picture, you can see that the space is designed for a variety of activities and the roles of the people also vary in that space. And if you don't mind, I saw that a hand went up, but I think we're asking that you pose your questions in the Q&A as opposed to raising your hand, and then we can address them at the end. So in multi-purpose spaces, the spaces are designed for multiple purposes, for multiple roles, and for a variety of activities. Also, the ages of the people using that space vary. So we can think about how do we design regulatory systems for all of early care and education so that it applies in centers and in homes for a variety of different caregivers who might be cycling in and out of care work at different periods of their professional life and their working life. What works for one set of people and in one location may not work across the whole system. So when we start from homes, we notice things that might be more distinctive. And that's a question that I pose to you. What looks different in homes and how can we design systems that support care across caregivers and across settings? We can build systems that support excellence across settings. And one document of which I'm really proud, we worked on here in the United States called a conceptual model for quality in home-based settings. And this is what I'm gonna present to you today is just a teeny tiny little appetizer of what I hope you find to be interesting in that whole document. The full report is available online. And in this document, we identified three core components of quality that we think could apply across settings, but that we designed starting from the perspective of home-based care. So the three big buckets or the big features, the big ideas in this conceptual model are foundations for sustainability, lasting relationships, and opportunities for learning and development. And I'm just gonna say a little bit more about each of those. So some key features to notice, this picture here, it, these are the child minders that took care of my son, Benjamin, from the time that he was three months old until he was three years old. And this is a picture of them on his very last day. Um, so the key features to notice here are it's important that we build sustainable systems that can support the well being of the child minders, the children, and the families. And so, our conceptual model for quality in home based care includes this bucket or this big idea of foundations um, as core to quality, not something separate that might make quality possible, but central to quality. We also include lasting relationships as a core piece of quality. Um, lasting meaning that they endure over time. This is something that's often distinctive in home-based childcare settings and something that we know is really important for children's development. Relationships are essential. 
And then also opportunities for learning and development is this notion that we want children to be able to climb, to be able to do more things as they get older. And so ensuring that children have opportunities to do what matters is another really essential pillar or key component of quality. Ah, I spoke right over those arrows and now they uh, animated into my slides. So another thing that I want to point out about this conceptual model for quality is that each of the bold terms, each of the elements within each of these big ideas is a verb. And that's because quality is not some abstract concept that happens out there where who knows how it happens. Quality is something that people do. People make quality happen. So childminders are engaged in creating and maintaining a safe environment, promoting their own self health and wellness, identifying and engaging with community resources, including other caregivers, developing nurturing relationships with children, facilitating children's relationships with each other. Quality happens in the actions, in what we do. And the final is that supporting children's whole selves where they are now and helping them be ready for what ne what's next is an essential part of quality in our view. So as I mentioned, this is just a tiny little taste of a conceptual model for quality that's available to you online. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next part of my talk. And again, you can post your questions in the Q&A. A central component of this conceptual model for quality is the idea that activities are what humans develop through. So one of my mentors was Thomas Wisner, and he talked about activities as stepping stones on pathways of development. And I have these images of different stepping stones in different settings because stepping stones are the activities that we construct with children guide children towards different outcomes. Just like one set of stepping stones leads to a meditation bench in a meditation garden, a quiet kind of activity. It's facilitating contemplation. These stepping stones are in a garden, and so they're helping to get across water. And these other stepping stones are in a river, and I would imagine these would be pretty slippery to get across, right? So the ways that we organize activities for children lead them to certain outcomes. And we wanna ensure that at the heart of quality early care and education settings, we're aware of what we're preparing children for. And we're emphasizing not just a single pathway to one kind of development, but we're preparing children for the kinds of activities that are important to the people that matter in children's lives. So in my research, I've identified two different destinations or um, local places where children's development can move toward. Now, this is based on my research in California, and I, I know Miriam's done some research in Ireland, so things look a little different in different locations. Um, but I found that some caregivers, that all caregivers varied in how much they valued or talked about and prioritized what they enacted in their daily routine activities with children and what they can see. In other words, what they tell rich stories about children experiencing. Um, so some caregivers valued, enacted, and saw love and affection, where relationships and being together are valued and important in and of themselves. Whereas for other caregivers, having fun and having relationships with children was something that developed almost as a byproduct of other things that they were doing. If you think about a typical center where children encounter multiple staff throughout the day, um, there is less priority on continuity across the day. That makes sense from a staffing perspective, 
but it also suggests that children are not going to experience the same level of continuity of care throughout the day. Um, or an example right here in Los Angeles, there was a, an initiative that was created to prioritize preschool for all children. And in that initiative, they identified the features of quality that were essential in high quality programs for three to five-year-olds. And that included curriculum. And they made the decision to have people who operate home-based childcare offer two separate programs for two separate groups of children, a part day program in the morning and a part day program in the afternoon. And necessarily, providers can't engage in the same kind of love and affection when they're needing to fit all of the learning activities into half a day. And the children are only spending half a day with them three days a week. They're not going to have the same kind of lasting and enduring relationships. So that's an example of making tough choices about what you want to prioritize and how those choices, like we can't be all things for all children. So the choices that we make in what we choose to prioritize have implications for how much time children spend practicing um, what they're doing in our care. And another cultural model that we see a lot here in the United States is this push to make home-based care look like a center-based preschool, where we see providers and caregivers, what you would call childminders, engaging in a lot of literacy and numeracy and um, circle time activities in ways that feel very much school-like. And that's very much what they're talking about as important in their interviews with um, the researchers on my project. It's important to keep in mind that these are just two of many possible destinations, but these two give you an example of how the kinds of activities that we set up on a day-to-day -day basis prepare children for certain outcomes. And it's important that we think critically and carefully about what kinds of activities we want to promote in childcare settings. Oh, let me give you one other example that goes along with that. The kind of example where a provider talks about prioritizing love and affection. So one of the things we found characteristic with our um, family child care educators in Southern California is that they would describe these wonderful stories of how they would have a plan for the day, but a child might come to the, their home that morning and feel really sad about something. So they would describe setting aside their plan for the day in order to talk with that child about what that child was going through. That's an example of showing a priority for love and affection in that moment over the other things that a caregiver, a childminder, an early care, um, an early educator might be choosing to do at that point in time. Okay, so how can we use this to design policy? So like many policymakers, and even for myself, I started life as a developmental psychologist. I'm often focused on children's developmental outcomes. And so I'm really interested in quality improvement and policies that can have an impact on children's development. My theoretical orientation suggests that if we wanna influence children's development, we really need to make sure that they are participating in activities that will allow them to become who they and we want them to be. And my research has suggested that if we want people to focus on the activities that matter for children, we have to understand that those activities take place in a setting, right? Which could be a home or a center, but that how people organize daily routine activities for children will depend in large part on the belief systems they have, right? Whether they're prioritizing love and affection or other things that they might be prioritizing, as well as their physical and material working conditions, those foundations for sustainability that must be present in order for caregivers to be able to engage in the activities that matter in particular, the ones that are aligned with their belief systems. And one of my colleagues helped me understand that 
the developmental outcomes don't have to be just for the child. They can also be for the child minder or caregiver or educator and for the family. Because when child minding works, it supports a whole family. I have to tell you that one of the most heartwarming things about having my children in a child minding setting when they were young was that when my daughter's school was closed, she could spend the day with her little brother in the child in the family childcare home where he still was located. And so she got to go back and see some of her friends that were still there and see um, the caregivers that had loved her so much when she was little. The activities have to fit for both the caregiver and the child. Um, and so we can design policies with the child minders, with the family, and with the children's outcomes all in mind. Because humans develop through our participation in the activities that matter. So based on all of these ideas, I would suggest, at least for me, and I hope you might agree, that the ultimate goal for designing a policy system that supports child minders, as well as a full early care and education system that is robust, is to build systems that support caregivers across settings to do what matters with children. I don't have the answers to the question, how can we do that well? But I have some good questions that I hope can start you on your journey and that can um, facilitate a rich discussion. So I remind you, this is a summary of the main points that I made. Supporting all caregivers appropriately, thinking about which caregivers are we targeting with which regulations and policies, designing an early care and education system for all settings, which regulations and policies make sense for all the settings we want to support. Can we have some overarching principles that are true, whether it's in a center or a home? Um, and then let's have some ways that they can look, some configurations of how that can look in different settings. Can we remember to focus on essentials? Which regulations and policies make caregiving more sustainable, support lasting relationships, and promote opportunities for learning and development? And are we designing systems that allow caregivers and children and families to practice what we want to be? How will our regulations and policies help children participate in activities that matter for their development? And while we're thinking about that, why don't we also think about the caregivers and the families and ensure that the policies we're building fit for all of the key stakeholders? So those are the main points that I wanted to share with you all today. I wanna to say thank you. Um, I can put my email address in the chat box if you wanna follow up with me. And I'll also put my project webpage in the chat box as well. Um, and I realized Miriam that I forgot to do the little quiz that I was gonna do before, but I'll do that now. All right, so we wanted to find out a little bit of information. Am I still okay on time to be able to do that? Who are you quiz now? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, so here we're hoping to have a little bit of interactivity. So if you hold your phone up to this QR code, it should open up the web page for you. Or if you go to the website that I'm going to put into the chat box, you should be able to join. I see a number of people are joining. So there, I just put the web page into the chat box. Now we've got 24 people who have joined. And on your phone, you should be able to reply to our question. All right, so I'm going to close this screen um, and know that you can still participate. You can still join by going to the website that I put into the chat box. 
It's wonderful to see we've got lots of child minders here in the audience, a student, public servants, some academics, ECEC -EC specialist, ECEC -EC educator, and maybe you could write in the chat box for someone from a different location what an ECEC -EC specialist means in your setting. Oh, the link isn't working, huh? Let me try that again. If I do it that way, see if that helps. Child-minding development officer, and I'm afraid I don't know what that means either. Okay, now we've got a few more people joining. We've overcome our technical difficulties. All right, and I'll remind you that you can post questions in the Q&A box. And now I think I am gonna open up the next question and hand it over to Miriam. Thank you for helping me understand what a specialist means in your context. So I was mistaken. I'm handing it back to Noireen. Uh, Dr. Hayes? Hi, Holly. I'm just standing here or sitting here looking at this wonderfully moving picture of <laughs> as names and, and, and what have you uh, get, um, get, get uh, um, added to. I think I've just removed myself from being visible. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I might have to be made visible again. Um, Holly, there's a couple of minutes um, just left of, of the time allocated to your presentation. And I was prompted when you asked for some guidance on the, um, on the, uh, the EC specialist and what it actually meant, just to ask you one or two things about um, the family childcare in the, in the US. So I think one of the things you, you, you might be able to help me understand is um, the you, you mentioned that your I think it was maybe was it your daughter was there and then she went to school um, and but on holidays she could go back to the same um, setting that your son was in. Um, in. In Ireland, it's often the case that at the end of a school day, the child would children would go back to a child minder. So the child minders would have maybe very young children and their older siblings be at school would come in. Would that be the same in, in the US system? So um, it's tricky to call it a US system because ah. there's not much of a system. And so absolutely that does happen when people are in a similar neighborhood, right? Um, because we don't really have an early care and education system, right? It's often called a mixed delivery model. Uh -huh. So there are some public settings, 
Mm -hmm. um, it's largely private settings and there's not, um, it's not consistent and it's very hard for people to find um, family childcare in particular. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is possible. And some of the children at the family childcare home where my children went did go back there after school. So then siblings stayed together for even longer. Yeah. Um, in my case, I had the opportunity to bring my children to the child care program on my university campus when they reached age three. And so they transitioned to that location. So th they didn't transfer back and forth within a day because yeah. the school setting was far away from where the family child care home was. Fair enough. Uh -huh. In our university settings where there are services, they take children in from um, about a year uh, so that, that you know, a, a, a sort of the siblings can be together in that kind of setting, but it is, they, they are centre based. Um, and I, I just, uh, one other query that I had for you that I think maybe, maybe um, people might be interested in is the issue of regulation. Um, to what extent there are regulatory systems there? Really good question. So um, regulation is at the state level in the United States. And so I'm in California. Mm -hmm. In California, we have a licensed family child care home that mm -hmm. can be either small with one caregiver or large with two caregivers. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and if you're a licensed family child care home, you can be eligible to receive a subsidy that the family gets mm -hmm. to help defray the costs of the child care. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so there are some incentives to enter into the licensed regulatory system, but there are a lot of um, people who would be required to be licensed, but who are not getting licensed. And so uh -huh. a big conversation here is about how do we get more people into the licensing system? And in some states, you can, so here for a small family child care home, you can have, the rules are really complicated, but roughly up to seven children, um, only two children under age two at a time. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have only children under age two, you can have four, right? So it's really complicated. But if you have a large family child care home, you could have up to 12 and 14, depending on the age configuration. Uh-huh. Yeah. That <laughs> and gets I'm, really complicated. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, even in Ireland where we're much, much smaller, it's, it's complicated too. But I think it's very interesting that you have an apparent resistance to licensing because it's certainly, we have far more child minders in Ireland than we have child minders registered. And I think the issue that you raised, you know, about the unique features, the distinct features, um, it's really important because the concern is exactly what you said, that, that childminders in the family will be regulated to the same requirements or the same set of standards or, you know, that as, as centre-based, whereas there are unique sort of elements which could be, uh, have standards of, uh, f assigned to them. Um, so I thought that was, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and when I was looking at the report, you gave those pillars that you you itemized. Um, some of them resonated really with me. And I thought that um, they could uh, provide a language for child minders to, particularly here in Ireland, now that the discussions are going, to actually articulate the difference between what they offer and what a centre offers without necessarily setting them up against in confrontation. Do you know, I think recognizing that they are different and 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 they have a particular um, unique set of features and parents may choose those over center based or whatever. Uh, so I wondered how to have, do you think, have you, do you think you've reached child minders to use the term in, in, in your work in a way that has given that language currency? Well, so again, it's such a vast, like the United States is just so vast. There are so many people. Um, so the answer I can give to that is that I have been involved with the National Association for Family Child Care. I would love to introduce Bernadette with Lanet Dumas, who's the executive director there. Um, so I've been able to talk with 
um, child minders through the National Association for Family Child Care. Um, and what I'm saying resonates with them a lot. Um, it's hard to get the kind of organization. So mm -hmm. I've done that both within California and at the National Association. Um, and there is so much going on at the policy level and the system has been in place. So retrofitting is really challenging, mm -hmm. um, but a number of people really like the language and are focused on picking it up and using it more. Yes. Um, yeah. State administrators are really frustrated because they want measurements aligned with those concepts and yeah. the measurements aren't always there. And in fact, I would argue that a lot of the measurements that exist actually take us in different directions. Yeah, I was really interested in your observation about Eckers and I, I wondered whether there are people maybe developing a kind of a, an instrument or really looking at the possibilities of, of I, I mean, I, I, there's part of me doesn't want to fall into the trap of measurement because I think it, the process is what really matters. But, you know, in a way one has to slightly buy into the system. So to, to, to be the one driving that buying in rather than being driven would be very helpful. Well, I'll um, forgive me for um, pulling up a web page while we're talking with a whole audience here. But this amazing tool, the Simple Interactions tool, uh -huh. I think it's not a research tool, but I think it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. So he talks, this is by Jun Lai Li, um, uh -huh. and he's now at Harvard, but he talks about connection, reciprocity, inclusion, and opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. And if I click on this opportunity to grow, he has this, each one has one of these beautiful illustrations that I find really intuitive and really helpful for both professional development and I think he's developing it as a research measurement tool as well. But like for opportunity to grow, he suggests, right? Um, there are three different patterns we can identify. One is unrealistic or undemanding, right? So this is the unrealistic expectations. And I can recognize that as a university professor, I have sometimes had unrealistic expectations for my students. Uh -huh. um, but the other kind of, Way, place we don't want to spend a lot of time is having undemanding expectations, mm -hmm. right? And I've certainly been in early care and education settings where they're not demanding for children and there aren't very many opportunities to grow. Mm -hmm. And then he describes incremental challenge with scaffolding, right? And I think this is pretty familiar to folks who have had much early childhood education background, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that you create the scaffolding and that helps the learner reach a higher height than they could otherwise reach. But then he has this beautiful illustration of what he calls scaffolding and fading, right? Where you provide the structure at the beginning so that the child can eventually reach higher heights on his or her own, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think something like this really presents us with interesting models for yes. having professional development conversations. And this would be a useful tool for support specialists to have conversations with child minders uh -huh. and to be having a record of what's kind of happening in those spaces. Yeah. The other thing that I think has a lot of promise are when people record videos of themselves that they can then share with the specialists and that can be analyzed. Mm -hmm. So in our research, we found that when the child minders take photographs of their interactions with children and then talk to us about those photographs, mm -hmm. we get rich, lovely conversations that really help us understand what they're thinking. Yes, yes. And that could be a really promising way to capture quality, yep. right? And to capture whether child minders are engaged in what matters to them and whether what matters to them is aligned with what matters in the larger system. Yeah, it's a, isn't it a way, isn't it a, a, a um, it's a, it's about the how you do these things, it, it really, because we do know when it's good or when it's not good. We know when it's working or when it's not working. So, so it's that, that idea of conversation as being the assessment tool between the regulator and the service is one that could be really 
quite interesting. And, and this link that you've made here prompted me to think of the work of a, co a colleague in, in, um, in Europe, Ferry Laver's work. You may or may not have heard of his, but he, he also has a language which is uh, about uh, well-being and inclusion and those sorts of issues that were coming up in that word cloud. Holly, it was really, really, um, really interesting. Um, it's come to half eight our time which is a break time. Um, you will be able to join us, Holly, for the um, panel discussion one, when Miriam has finished. And um, I think uh, the questions are beginning to come in, but I think you certainly, I, I certainly have a number of questions from your presentation that I want to follow through. I found it really, really enjoyable. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have a 10 minute break. Um, and following that, um, Dr. Anne-Marie Halpenny will uh, welcome us back and introduce Miriam. So uh, Holly, I look forward to seeing you later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So uh, hopefully we have you all back with us after our break. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Halpenny. I'm a, a lecturer on the BA in Early Childhood Education in TU Dublin, Technological University of Dublin. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to our next presenter, Dr. Miriam O'Regan. I had the pleasure of co-supervising Miriam's doctoral research uh, with Professor Noreen Hayes. And so I'd just like to give you a little bit of background information uh, with regard to Miriam before she starts her presentation. So Miriam was awarded her PhD in November 2020 from TU Dublin for research into professionalization of childminding in Ireland, having worked herself as a childminding advisory officer for nearly a decade prior to that. Um, Miriam has had three articles published uh, on her doctoral research in peer-reviewed journals to date, and a fourth article in press at the moment and due for publication shortly. And also um, worth saying that Miriam has disseminated her um, doctoral research both nationally and internationally over a number of years. So just currently, Miriam is conducting postdoctoral research into employability at the Centre for Psychology, Education and Emotional Intelligence in TU Dublin as part of the Transform Edu study. So I'm very pleased to hand you over to Miriam now, whose presentation is entitled The Childminding Difference in Ireland. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you see me okay? Let me see, I need to get my... <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I'm so delighted that you're all with me today. Um, I, I wasn't that fab. I thought Holly was amazing, just amazing. And when I heard about her approach to research, I, I had to use it. It was Anne-Marie who found the article and I kind of just fell in love and wanted to try and to do um, an eco-cultural study in Ireland. So what I'm going to share with you now is really, um, I'm going to try and share this. Let's see, does this work? Um, I'm going to share with you my um, some findings and as well as that, some, and how can I get into it to do this? Um, Hang on now. <clears throat> bottom right. Bottom right? What about the bottom right? Oh, hang on. Slideshow. Yep, I'll try again. <laughs> I'll try again, I'll try again. I can't get the thing to move along. Okay. So, can you all see it okay? Um, yeah. Uh, Miriam, if you go down to the bottom of your screen and you see the little kind of projector screen beside the, um, you know, the plus and minus, there you there go. There you are. I got it. I just, I had to move the, the other thing out of the way. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to talk about, um, as, as um, Anne-Marie mentioned, um, I did my PhD in Irish childminding and I was so exciting to do it because it was the first study that focused on childminding. And since childminding is such a, a vital part of our childcare system in Ireland, in a way that's bizarre that it took us this long to get into that. But thanks to Noreen, I had the opportunity and thanks to um, uh, Holly, I had a great tool. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things I found. And then I'm also gonna share about um, the idea of what difference does childminding make to childminders. And I want to kind of pull out a few strands of information that I found in the literature that talked about various types of outcomes. So, okay, 
here we go. Now let's see, can, can we get it to move forward? That's the next thing. Ah, so how is child minding the same as? And I'm thinking about child minding, group care and relative care, because relative care is a huge sector also. In fact, um, I think it's, it's probably the largest single sector where um, roughly 75% of relative care is done by grandparents. So if you think about it, due to the legislation, as was mentioned earlier, the typical group size for a child minder, the most will be six. But in group child care, it can be very large. It can go up to 22, um, you know, it could be 11 children to one uh, carer, but it could also be a large group of up to 22 people, uh, children. And then in, in relative course, you just have smaller numbers. And as I say, less than three, you have to think it's only family sized, literally. Child minding, you've got mixed ages, not to 12. And um, a, a lot of child minders do have a large, large range. But in group child care, as we said before, it's segregated by age. But in relative care, you will have mixed ages, but it tends to be the smaller, a smaller range because it's only the size of, um, you know, a couple of children from the same family. Whereas child minder has several families involved. Obviously, group child care has lots of families. Relatives really only deal with their immediate relatives, typically. In child minding, the family home in Ireland is adapted. And I put that in specifically because I found that anybody who was doing child minding in the paid form actually put a lot of effort into getting an environment that was very suitable for that purpose. Of course, in group child care, you have lovely purpose built centres. And in relative care, you tend to have, when I say family homes, it could be the relative's home or the family home. <laughs> they don't tend to be necessarily adapted. In child minding, it is paid, but often within very informal contacts, some written, some not written, whereas in group child care, they're always formal contracts. And in relative care, it's kind of, it's unpaid or paid in kind or very low cost. It's mainly seen as a labor of love. Um, the education of child minders is varied. In my research, I found that roughly a third of the participants had degrees, uh, 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 but, um, not necessarily in childcare. And um, as we know, in group childcare, you have to have qualifications in ECC starting at level five uh, in our system. And of course, in relative care, there's no, the, it's parental experience is really what's of interest. And so in the National Child Minding Initiative, we were, there was a really um, uh, an effort to help child minding become more professional and with a system of training and grants. And I think that we have to say that, that we can see there has been considerable impact in how childminders are approaching childminding today. So how is childminding different? Well, this is where I did what Holly was describing there. I had a, in, a youth ecoculture approach where we had these lovely conversational interviews with photographs that the childminders had taken of their own practice, as well as some observations. I did some observations in the home and the interactions and a background survey. And what I found were these two models. Now, as Holly says, there are many models, there are many destinations, but these were two that were common in, in the research that I did. So in the strong relationship, the, sorry, the close relationship model, which is very like what Holly was describing where love and affection is the priority. The priority really was strong relationships with love, affection and fun being the core of it all. And uh, one of the lovely quotes I got was, one reward is the bond that you get with the children you're looking after, because it's a lot closer than, say, when you're in a creche where it's bigger and you might not be with the same children all the time. And again, the, the focus is on interactions and care and play and conversation. I loved one lady said, um, my only rules are like you have to have fun. You're here to have fun and you're here to play. <laughs> and there was that lovely sense of um, prioritizing the children's happiness and well-being in, in, the, in the service. And also about togetherness and relationship building. And one thing that really struck me was how um, child minders were interested in supporting the parents and the families. And uh, one lady described how she had a very anxious mom at the start. It says she said she needed a lot of reassurance, tears in the hallway from her and from the child, just giving them a lot of time both in the morning and the evening especially, just help to create the relationship. And that struck me, that, that care that the childminder was showing the mum and the family. 
And from that comes these lasting relationships that endure outside and after the childcare is over, these relationships go on. And um, many of them said, you know, it's nearly like my extended family. I, I loved one lady said she, she was a lot, she'd been child minding for 30 years. She said, I've had kids who've had their kids. And you know, they'll go, they'll ring me up and they say, any chance you're free? And that's lovely, that's rewarding. So in, in, in the group that I researched, which were all small scale childminders, none of them had more than, uh, I mean, the largest was six, uh, a group of six. Most of them were exempt from regulation. So they had three or fewer um, toddlers and they might have a couple of school age children. And a lot of those were uh, tend to be coming and going. They mightn't be all together all the time. But I found that school readiness was not a model that was really popular um, in, in the group that I was researching with. Instead, they prioritized flexible learning. And one of the key phrases was, it all depends, it all depends. And um, so it kind of was grounded in everyday experiences as they happened. If the child was um, unwell, then they had one kind of, ex uh, of, of day. And if they had, they didn't always have a, a, a big plan and the plan was very flexible if they did. Um, it was very much led by the child or in the child and child mind relationships. And so the photograph showed me things of children preparing food or helping with laundry and growing vegetables, climbing trees, you know, all playing with pets, all that sort of um, everyday learning was going on as the child was interested in it. And it was very much embedded in mixed age groups with siblings together. And so I thought I had some lovely photographs of like two and three year olds with 10 and 12 year olds. And in one of my observations, I was just really, there was a pair of older sisters say that were around seven and nine, and they were playing shop with the two and three year olds, teaching them how to count, teaching them how to, you know, the correct way to ask for something, the polite way to speak and so on. It was really lovely. And it was set up behind a, a sofa. The shop was set up behind the sofa. But I have to say that they really sought to, the, all these childminders were um, focusing on enriching uh, learning experiences by delivering them in a, an enhanced home and outdoor environment. And you could see the impact of all those um, childminder development grants of a thousand euro, which people had gotten and how they'd invested that in making their services as, um, as, as rich as, as possible. And, um, and it was also very importantly, uh, punctuated by regular outings in the community. I mean, even routine collections at schools were, were uh, part of, the, of, the, of that learning curve where, where uh, these younger children were getting to know the school and become familiar with the playground and, and, and just the whole um, setting before they ever went to preschool or big school, as we call it here. And I think one of the things that I loved most about it was you could see the skill that childminders had in, in, um, in using the older or helping the older children to uh, provide scaffolding for the younger children's learning. So while the older children were sort of maybe growing in empathy and a sense of responsibility, the younger ones were also increasing vocabulary and, uh, and learning all kinds of uh, social skills through it all. So those are the two models that I identified in um, Irish childminding settings, which were really quite distinctively different from a lot of what you find in the, more, in, in the group care settings, but also in relative care, because you would not necessarily have a, the, the mixture of, of um, ages and the, or even just the size of the group. So there'd be, you know, there'd be just a, it's a slightly larger setting, let us say. So when I when to look, this is just now going to be based more on things that I read that I found fascinating <laughs> in my research, literature research. And what difference does child minding make to children? And um, what I found was really in the literature to date, anyway, there were two main focuses. There's a focus on how um, on the processes of what's happening in, in child minding. So for example, that this was a home from home, the unhurried low stress environment for the child. And Grunefeld talks about low um, stress hormones, for example, and how the child 
is not anxious or, or um, uh, perturbed in the way it can happen sometimes in larger settings. And Bowlby talks about the how important it is to have to have that person who's committed to you. And this is the son of the famous Bowlby, but he, he very much stresses the, the, um, the small scale settings benefit and the processes of attunement and sensitivity in those settings and how that benefits um, the child. So again, yes, this one-on-one, -on -one, that's a phrase that I heard a lot. Home from home was used a lot and one-on-one. -on -one. So it's the idea of the child, the individual attention in a sensitive, attuned relationship. Um, Childminders were very proud of how, they, how well they knew their children, how they could look at the child and know if the child was unwell or, or unhappy or needed something. Um, and so it was very, very much sensitive and attuned relationships. A large study in um, Holland has done, in Holland, Belgium, in Flanders. They've, it's called MIMOQ. Um, they did a whole study on process quality um, using, let me think, the class tool, class infant and class toddler. And they compared 200 um, group care settings and 200 um, family childcare settings. But overall, they found that the quality in both were pretty similar. Uh, not that great, actually. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things that they found out that was really interesting is they found group size matters more than staff ratio in terms of quality as measured by the class tool. And, um, and that was very interesting because they were, so basically, uh, you know, the smaller the group, the better the quality, no matter the staff ratio which I thought was very interesting. And it, it would suggest that um, it, that one-on-one, -on -one, that process obviously works better in a smaller group. And also they found for child mind, uh, in the latest study about child, the family childcare settings, which Van den Broek has just brought out, he, sh he found, they found that child minders did better with well-being and emotional support than literacy and numeracy. As, a, as, a, as measured again by that tool. So you could see that this is, this is echoing things that I had found. Um, how does it impact on children's outcomes though? So what does that look like? So we've had a few um, little snippets to, uh, from previous studies. Growing up in Ireland highlighted certain outcomes for um, childminders, which they called, I believe, non-relative childcare, I think was the, the phrase. So they found better speech and language development at five, even taking into consideration, you know, um, socioeconomic background and education of parents, all that. There was still what they called a modest, a modest positive effect on language, speech and language development at the age of five, uh, having looked at, at children who'd been with childminders at three and again at five. So, um, and again, they also found better socio-emotional outcomes at five. In, that, in terms of fewer socio-emotional difficulties and higher levels of pro-social behaviour as measured by their, their parents and their primary school teacher, who they would have just started, obviously, at this point with the primary school teacher. Um, in the study of early education and development in the UK, actually, it showed very similar findings at age three and four. At age five, however, all the children in that particular study weren't doing so well, no matter what kind of uh, care they were in, apparent, according to the measures they were using. They were using the um, SJU, you know, the shared sustained thinking and emotional well-being was one of the tools that they used. What they did find when they drilled down, though, that child minding, child, children from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, did better and showed more resilience in the new setting that they were in because um, at five in England, they had all by that point moved into um, primary school settings or in the UK. So it, they suggested it may be that a greater level of one-to-one -one interaction indivi in individual ECEC, i.e. child minding, is helpful in building children's emotional resil resilience, particularly for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. So these are some of the things that sort of other research is showing. So what are the, what should we be researching now, I wonder? So one of, uh, Lynn Ang has written, Professor Lynn Ang has written a great article on um, research up to 2016. One of her question is, how might childminding provision be assessed? And Holly brought that up again today. Um, I think one of the things that in my conversations with childminders during my research, 
there was a great deal of anxiety that childminding would be assessed in such a way that the essence of childminding would be hindered, would be uh, destroyed is too strong a word, but in a way that wouldn't, let us say, support the essence of childminding. So how might childminding provision be assessed? I think that's a great question. And again, how does childminding link with child outcomes? Ang showed uh, that resilience factor, the support for transitions, support for families. These are all things she mentioned. But what's the mechanism? How is childminding linking uh, with that? How does this, uh, you know, work? <laughs> what's, what's happening? And what factors lead to better outcomes for children at childminders? What are the contributory factors? Now, I'm only talking about the children in this situation. Vanden Broek um, looks at training. He suggests pre-service training would be essential. That's his view. But that's not based on current findings. That's what he recommends. Um, on the other hand, Mellowish uh, and the, in the UK study, um, they're looking at existing um, what's happening now. He's found a link between in-service training and good, better outcomes for children. And similarly, is it supports or is it supervision, inspection, advisors? What is the best kind of supports? Mellor's study suggested that networks um, and, and training and networks, that kind of support works well in promoting um, good outcomes for children, the kind of good outcomes that we, he found. And the last question that I thought would be really interesting to look at is how do children experience their home-based childminding setting. I don't think, Lynn Arnum mentions this, and I, I have not found any study that really tries to um, uh, find out how the children feel about what's happening. And I know that um, Amory, Dr. Amory Halpenny has recently published a book about research with young children. And I feel like there's a great, there's a great project in that. Um, and it would be so interesting to find out how children feel and think about their time with childminders. So on that note, I think I'm just about done. Oh, sorry, look at that. I forgot my last question. How could the benefits of childminding for families be strengthened? And again, in England, there's been some studies on how families are, are um, work with childminding and, in, and their children and how these families, I mean, parents are definitely choosing childminding because of some of the perceived uh, types of quality that I've mentioned in the previous slides, um, there's no question that they perceive great benefits um, for themselves and their children coming from the home from home environment, the one on one, that, that um, spe specialized and individual support that comes to the family in a way that cannot happen when you have larger numbers. Just, you know, structurally, it's harder to do that. So again, how, how does that, I, I loved Holly's um, final input there, uh, the idea that you want to make the system work for all the stakeholders, the childminders, the children, and the families. And I can't, I just say, yes, that's, that is where we want to go. So I've included, I think a whole bunch of, um, am I just about done here? Hang on. Oh yeah, this is just, just so you know, I did read a few things. And thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stop sharing now, and I need to hand it back to you, Anne Marie, right? Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing if I can just figure that out now. Thank you, Miriam, and thanks so much for your presentation. Um, you know, again, lots of interesting things there to think about. Um, we have a little bit of time just before we go to our panel discussion. So maybe just a couple of questions that were coming in there. I, I can maybe just put to you, Miriam. Um, okay, yeah. Somebody, just a very broad question that was coming up there in the in the question and answer was, how, how would you define childminding? It's a very broad question, obviously. Um, <laughs> so maybe even yourself and Holly, just thinking about that in terms of your the research you've done. Is yeah. there... What, what kind of things come to mind in terms, I know, for example, we did the word search there. So I suppose a lot of those ideas came up. Yeah, were... yeah, yeah. I think the small numbers in Ireland, we define, it's defined by the home-based setting, the small numbers and the single carer. Oh yes, that would be cool. But we, we do that in a minute, will we Holly? 
sorry, Holly asked me, do we have another, we have another interactive slide. <laughs> Great. Okay. We, we just, I, I suppose that would be in Ireland, but then in, 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 in Holly's scenario in, in California, they also yeah. have larger um, kinds of child home-based settings, which yeah. in France also, France also has that kind of, where you can have two childminders with a large, slightly larger group, but still in a home. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose the home is key, isn't it? And the, yeah. and the smaller group size. And and you you didn't, Miriam. Mary, I think one of the differences between your findings and say Holly's, obviously in the states, was um, you didn't have that. You didn't get that kind of predominance of that school readiness model. No, but I did feel I felt myself that that had got to do with the fact that our child minding here has been defined as very small. Yeah. Whereas I felt for Holly, uh, probably, I imagine, Holly, am I right in saying the school readiness model was probably more prevalent with the larger, larger scale uh, child mining settings, family care, child care homes? I do think that the size has something to do with it. And I also think the larger policy context that um, yeah. that's that's it's a big part of the discussion around early care and education here. Um, uh, and it's even more true in Florida, where that's very much, that's been a big policy push, is um, having kids ready for school. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I would think that's pretty big here too, isn't it, Noreen or Anne-Marie? Um, well, I, I think probably having children ready for school is very important. But I think, again, maybe we've, we've tried to kind of um, move away from kind of focusing exclusively on that. Yeah. Um, and again, in, I suppose, just based on what Holly was saying, there are so many different types of childcare, I suppose, compared to what maybe what, what we're looking at here, uh, Miriam. So I suppose that would probably explain that difference. Also, I think there's a, an interesting, excuse me for leaping in here, but there's an interesting possibility with the development of our national primary school curriculum and our national curriculum framework for early childhood education, which incorporates child minders and even incorporates parents advice and suggested for parents. But the opportunity there, you can, the, the trend is towards a more um, holistic and, and um, uh, focus not on subjects and not on the specific kind of literacy and numeracy, but a play-based kind of move across as children get older till the age six and seven, beginning then to introduce more formalized subject areas. So I think early childhood education thinking, which is manifest in child minding, as you found both of you, um, Holly and Miriam, is actually beginning to, to drift up the educational ladder mm, at least mm. in the rhetoric <laughs> at least in the <laughs> rhetoric yeah. anyway i'm not supposed to be can i maybe um ask you something holly if, that, if that's okay and and miriam and holly i really, really enjoyed both of your presentations they were both uh, really fascinating but um to start with holly i i was really struck by your comments about um maybe using principles um or values um, I think it's, you know, actually it's been used, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but certainly here you see it in organisational, um, you know, they have the vision and the mission and values and so on. So it is quite well used here, but not um, so far in the early years sector. And I think it's, it's a really um, interesting idea because if, if you can establish what the values are, what the principles are, how they manifest in different settings. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it, it, I don't know, Miriam, if you, if you have any comment on that. I can start us off on that. Um, and for my research, drawing from Tom Wisner's work, I really frame it in terms of personal meaning, right? Mm -hmm. That engaging in meaningful activity and I think that there's a similarity between that and values. Um, and I haven't ever tried to articulate what the main difference is. So this will be a little bit off the cuff. But I think a part of it is that um, we often think of values. I think of like mission statement. And I think of, um, and also in the United States, it's been measured a lot in terms of progressive and traditional values. And personal meaning is much more individual. Mm -hmm. um, I did some mm -hmm. research in the past where I was looking at progressive and traditional beliefs. And 
they often li- they coexist in people. <laughs> yeah. um, so we tend to think of them like conceptually, they're quite different and they're often opposites. And yet we live with contradictory beliefs a lot. And we see that in behavior, that our behavior can be quite contradictory. I'm one parent when I'm um, not in a hurry and I'm a different parent when I'm in a hurry, <laughs> right? Make me yeah. late for work and have a child who's tired and crabby and see what my parenting looks like there, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to personal meaning, which is the stuff that fills up my bucket of peace and brings me joy. Yeah. And so that would be Mm -hmm. the distinction that I make. And maybe it's true in the context of work that doesn't pay very well in the United States, that personal Mm -hmm. meaning is often what sustains people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens, you get a quality rating system that comes in and tells someone that they're quote unquote low quality and the personal meaning, it guts you because you've been doing this because it's something that really is personally meaningful. And then someone comes in and tells you that it's not good enough. And that's really, you know, that will really take the sale, the wind out of your sales. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, Um, there's a bit of that values and also the way that it lives inside your body. And also, um, if I may, Holly, um, you are the charm under, you are the setting. You are, you know, Mm. you know, if something isn't deemed to be quality appropriate, that couldn't be more personal. Yeah, it's so true. Mm. And I think that's why... When, when people are talking about, you know, uh, education or regulation, we have to say, well, is it, is it fitting? Is it the right fit for childminding? Because what's the point in having education in, uh, say, I don't know, Montessori, which is great in itself, but is not really suited, perhaps, to a childminding setting. And then other people, so one person could take that and make it their own and, and transform it so that it fits a childminding um, setting, and then another person would find it completely useless. <laughs> so I think there's there's a lot of areas where perhaps, you know, I, I think one of the elements I found was that childminders have a lot of agency about what they do. They love being their own boss, but not just that that means, well, I can do what I like, but because they loved having the possibility of creating a unique setting and with with, with their wooden furniture or, or whatever it was, <laughs> you know, I found that many times they had very specific, some, some were big into the garden and they had a whole gardening thing going with their children. And it was all quite unique and, and it was very much dependent on the, um, on the childminder and the children and how that came together. So I think that we need to be, how would you say, sensitive to this very precious kind of environment so that that the benefits still are are not are not lost in measurements. I think that's probably how I feel about it anyway. And I mean, I think as well, we're, we're enormously fortunate because um, we're at the beginning of um, designing something. You know, yeah. people are open to thinking laterally and to um, being creative and innovative and looking mm-hmm. outside and seeing what's working and what's challenging. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, that's hugely important. Yeah. I want to piggyback off something Miriam just said there too. And that agency, right? Us grownups, we tend to talk a lot about agency. I I don't mean to make light of what you were just saying, but also agency is so essential to play, right? And so that capacity is that self direction yes. of yeah, childminders yeah. is something that I think facilitates what we want for children as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, everybody. Um, can we begin maybe our panel discussion? If I, if I could just read you out some of the questions that have come in, would that be okay? Mm-hmm. Can I, can we, can we do our, do our little quizzy thing first? Sure, Miriam, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Holly. <laughs> We've got one more quiz for you.
How do we get into it, Mary? Really? So. Oh, it, it should be. It's wholly opened it up. You go into the same way. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So the idea is you can say which area are you in, interested in and how interested you are. Are you very, not at all interested or very interested? Mm, ah, open it, that's a good idea. <laughs> is any, oh, yay, we're starting to get. <laughs> I, you can open it again if you want to. Maybe you could explain what's happening there. Okay, so people are um, voting on what they're most interested in. Which area? So, could you maybe open it up again, Holly? I think, yes. So it's showing as still open. Yeah. Um, but again, what now. we can see here is that we have people who are extremely interested in children's experiences as childminders, which is in yes. orange. Yes. Um, so we have quite a few people who have said that that's the highest, right? Five. Yes. Um, and I think the average is 4.1 for that one. And then yeah. we also have a lot of interest in children's outcomes with childminders. So mm -hmm. this focus on children's development as the ultimate goal of the policy. And I then an average of 4.3 there. Mm -hmm. And oh, then the they blue, want to vote some more, Holly. They want to vote some more. Oh, open okay. it again. Open it. The blue is about assessment of child minding provision. And so there is some interest there. One of the things I've noticed in the United States is that a lot of um, policymakers spent a lot of money on those assessments. And then there wasn't that much money left for the improvement piece. Ah. So I would offer that note of caution. Mm -hmm. it, a lot of the assessments are very expensive. <laughs> yeah. and leaves less money in the budget so um worth paying attention to and then the professional education for child minders is right there up with assessment of child minding provision mm -hmm. but the average for those is 3.3 for professional education and 2.8 for assessment of child minding provision mm. so the highest yeah. is children's outcomes with child minders. The right. second highest is children's experiences at child minders. The third is professional education. And then um, the lowest of those is assessment of child minding provision. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Very interesting. Cool, thanks. Thank you, Holly. Lovely. And I'll okay. send you those results. Oh, sorry, Anne-Marie. No, thanks so much, Holly. That's really interesting. Um, so I'm just going to uh, put a few questions that have come in on the question and answer. And again, anybody, uh, you know, any of the panelists who'd like to answer are welcome to do so. So one of the questions, it, there's quite a lot of interest in the, the licensing, Holly, in, in California and kind of the details of that. But one of the questions I think that's kind of maybe for everybody was that, do you, do you think that the regulations may not be meeting the needs of child minders and they tend to prioritize, if you like, the child and the family over child minders? That's a question that has come in. So any, would anybody like to take on that question? I'm happy to start us off on that question. Yeah, Holly, okay. Um, part of what I, I think that I've heard some federal regulators in the United States talk about licensing as the entry into a formal system of support. And I think that's a lovely idea, but I don't think that's how most people experience it. And so I have some lovely stories, some one-off stories from participants in my research who described having a licensing representative who is very supportive and Rosemary Allen in Colorado has designed a system where there's feedback from the um, child, the educators into mm -hmm. the state licensing system. So that when there, for example, is a regulation that requires um, equipment that's no longer available on the market, 
there's a way to get that feedback into the regulatory system so that it better supports the um, providers, educators, as well as the children and families. Okay. Um, mm. And so that would be one piece that I would add. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm just thinking about um, I, I, the system that most surprised me is the system in France in that, firstly, it's a huge it is the largest sector for under three care is is child minding, and um, like they have they have millions. <laughs> they have too many. Or no, no, no. Millions is an exaggeration. Hundreds of thousands, but a very high ratio of like uh, there's a child minder for every forty child or some children of under the age of three. It's a very high ratio. What struck me about them though is how how low it is on regulation. So yes, you do a little training course and you get a certificate and you have a you get a, an initial um, assessment, but after that, for five years, you get supervision, where nobody is um, nobody's ticking any boxes. They come in the the super your your officer or your is a supervisor really in the sense that she comes in and has a chat with you, and um, they don't they don't even take notes. The supervisors they just talk to you about how the children are getting on, how are you getting on, how are the families getting on, and then every five years the child minders have to renew their license. And that's the only time they are inspected again. And I just thought, obviously it's working very well in the sense that um, it's attracting a lot of people. At least it's doing that. So yeah. a, a good provision. But I, I, and I was interested by, I think it was the common, it was the ratio of supervision to inspection, if you see what I mean. Inspection was rare, quite low down but super, support and supervision was much higher. They mm -hmm. all clean network meetings and all that kind of thing too, run by the same, I'm calling supervisor, that's maybe not the right word, but support person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it made, it made a very different sort of balance. And I felt it was very well adapted to the way childminding works in France. Yeah, interesting. Bernadette, yeah. did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, coming back to this idea of being innovative, I, I think that perhaps, you know, in, in some areas of our lives, we do um, seem to be quite over-regulated, mm -hmm. you know, there's a danger um, that you can actually sort of extinguish something if, if you regulate it, you know, too, too, uh, too much. Um, Obviously, the, the, the welfare of the child is the priority and um, something obviously everybody here tonight would be sitting here talking about this if they didn't care passionately about it. Um, but I do think it, it's interesting that the, the model in Scotland where um, the inspector um, very much focuses on the, um, the child and how they're interacting with the other children, how they're interacting with the child mind. Yeah. And really, in a way, I mean, you know, not wanting to be too business-like about it, but that's your product, really, isn't it? You know, that, that shows far more than your tick box sheet or, or whatever, how relaxed the child is, you know, how well they're doing, how they mix and so on. But, I, you know, I think that does sound very interesting about the situation in France because it's obviously thriving. Yeah. And we really need childminding to thrive in Ireland, not just... Yeah. You know, we are passionate about child minding, but you know, it's a cornerstone of the economy, at helping and supporting people back to work. In rural Ireland, that you know, in many areas there aren't creches. You know, so parents unfortunately don't have a choice. But to keep people in rural Ireland and to be able to work, you know, it's absolutely critical. Um, as well as all the benefits to the children and the families that they get from using the child minding service, you know. Yeah. So it's really important this is done well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a, another question here. Um, for I suppose it's more for Holly. Uh, Holly, you, you mentioned again just that school readiness and that emphasis on school readiness. In your, just in your own opinion, do you think that in, in, those, in those settings where there was more of an emphasis on that academic achievement, was that coming from the the childminders, or do you think it was coming more from parents? Does it, you know, is there, could you identify as to whether the, that kind of, uh, it was that kind of value of the school readiness was being generated more through parents or from the childminders themselves? Um, I can't answer that question from mm. any sort of research basis. Yeah. I know that 
Um, even at the preschool that my children attended later, the teachers would complain that parents often wanted to see more worksheets with numbers and things. <laughs> and so that would suggest to me that there is a good push from parents for that. Yeah. Um, mm. But I also think that um, child, my, it, you know, family child care providers here vary a lot. And so some of that's sort of the image that many people bring to them. And then one final piece to that puzzle is that um, there's a heavy emphasis on testing in the United States educational system in general. And so I imagine that that has a lot to do with that school readiness emphasis here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Holly. Um, another question, just again, a, a brief question, maybe more Bernadette and um, Miriam. Uh, some people were interested just in that idea that Holly was talking about where there was more than one child minder in the home. Mm -hmm. Now, they were, they were saying, we're not talking about, um, you know, a, a crash or kind of a group setting, but um, they were wondering about the possibility of that, what, what yourself or Bernadette would think about that, having more than one child minder in the home. Um, do you want to go first, Miriam, or will I? Um, well, I've seen it, and it works well. That's all I can say about it. But I, I, I don't have any research on it other than uh, from my own experience. I saw that a, a lovely pair of friends who did a great job, and I know that they use it in France. But uh, other than that, I haven't got great experience of it. And again, I, I wouldn't have any factual information on, on that here in Ireland, but just as a I suppose it depends. I mean, in some ways, you know, the very sort of core of child minding is that it's that, you know, one-on-one um, uh, -on -one sort of uh, basis that you're working in. But we have to be realistic and child minding has to be sustainable. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, child minders aren't particularly well paid um, at the moment. Um, so maybe it will be different horses for different courses in the same yes. way. Holly was saying that there's a tremendous variety of child minders in California. Well, certainly that's, that's very true here in Ireland. And families do tend to try and find somebody that suits their family. Yeah. Mm. So I think, you know, maybe different things will suit different people. Um, yeah. And that's probably as much as I could say, really. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, I know I can see we're kind of running out of time. I have two more maybe questions that I could ask um, if I could just put them um, to you. Um, Holly, just for you, again, you, you talked a little bit about outcomes for children, for carers and for families. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit more about what you what you mean by that or just to expand a little bit? Yeah, so um, something that's been a big trend here uh, with the research about toxic stress and caring for caregivers as well as for children um, is this idea of dual generation and so, for example, when Head Start programs can help families that are living in poverty connect to social services. Um, and so when um, family child care homes are connected to networks and can help families connect with those networks. Or another example would be um, families that are a linguistic minority so that then you can have support for a home language in the family childcare home. That's another example of a family outcome as opposed mm -hmm. to just a child outcome. And then my colleague in Australia, Joss Nuttall, talks a lot about the professional development of the educator. And so thinking about the educator's development, is the educator getting opportunities to practice and opportunities for growth? Um, and uh, opportunities for ongoing learning as well as breaks and their own healthcare needs being met. Those are some of the things that I have okay. in mind. Very interesting, Holly, thank you. Miriam, here's one for you, question for you. Um, specifically, I think um, somebody is asking, how can we influence policymakers in the National Action Plan so that it, you know, so that the, the aims and aspirations don't get lost with center-based settings? Do you want to say anything on that? Yeah, well, no, that's the million dollar question right there. The million dollar question for you. <laughs> I mean, if we had the answer to that, we'd all be laughing. Mm. I, I honestly, I'm not sure. I suppose, you know, you can annoy the hell out of your TD. That's a start. Or, um, and I suppose, the, I, I, I guess I feel fundamentally that the more good research we can do, the more we make the case for what child minding is and make it visible. Mm -hmm. so, can be seen that we have our articles in, I don't know, 
the RTE brainstorm or the Irish Times, the more, you know, that, that we make child minding visible, the more I think that will impact um, policymakers. I don't, I, I mean, I do believe they want to do what's best. They just don't always know what the best is, you know? <laughs> sure. No, I, I agree, Miriam. I think, you know, things have to be evidence-based and fact-based. I mean, when you're going to use public money, you know, that's that's the reality that-, that Yeah. You know, um, but I do think there's also strength in numbers. And I do mm -hmm. think that if childminders, you know, you don't have to join Childminding Ireland. We have a big database of childminding contacts who can keep you informed. And so if you, if childminders would just bring along another couple of childminders, I think we can really have, you know, a really good opportunity to make sure that childminders are informed, that it's a two-way process. They can inform as well as receive information and be really part of a sort of grassroots movement. And that, and it can come, you know, from the bottom up because, like I was saying earlier, childminders are the experts on childminding, yeah. and we really do need policy makers to listen. They're, they're, unfortunately, sometimes I think because the predominant um, form of childcare in terms of, of the department and, and would be centre based, so it's very influential. And, and you know, obviously, colleagues working in centre based have huge amounts of experience and knowledge and. Um, all sorts to offer and contribute and different things suit different families, different things suit different children. Um, mm. But there is, you know, one way of thinking sometimes, which can be quite frustrating when you're trying to influence. Absolutely. Thank you, Bernadette. Add to that if I just might. Yes, Holly. Um, and I, I really, the phrase evidence-based, I hope that we can that I encourage you all to push back against that a little bit, right? Because sometimes the evidence base hasn't always asked the right questions. This isn't a criticism, right? Yeah. Early childhood education has been um, uh, underfunded across lots of parts of the world. And so the, if the evidence base hasn't asked the questions about child minding in particular, then it's important to point out that yeah. um, we need to also draw from the people who are doing the work. Does that make sense? So that we yeah. can bring the research together with the perspectives of the people who have been underrepresented in that research. Yeah. Very important. Very, very good point, I think, Holly. Okay, everybody, yeah, I think that, uh, I, 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 I know we have probably lots of more questions that we'd, we'd love to, to continue the, the, the discussion here, but hopefully it will continue after the, after the webinar um, and we'll keep in touch, obviously. So, um, I'd just like to um, maybe begin to wrap things up if I could, and um, I'd like to take this opportunity just to acknowledge and thank a number of people um, who made it possible to um, for this webinar to happen. So first of all, we'd just like to thank the RECC, the Researching Early Childhood Education Collaborative, and Childminding Ireland. Um, for facilitating this really interesting webinar session. I think we've all really enjoyed it and certainly the feedback is, is really very positive. We're very grateful in particular to Professor Noreen Hayes in the RECEC and Bernadette Orbinski-Burke from Childminding Ireland for hosting this event. So thank you um, to both of those in particular. A very special thank you to our presenters. Um, to Professor Holly Ann Tonyan from California State University in Northridge, who's joining us this evening from the, the US, and to Dr. Miriam O'Regan, whose great commitment to childminding in Ireland has motivated her very interesting research. So thank you, Holly and, um, and, and Miriam. Thank you also to Bernadette for joining us and to Bernadette, Holly and Miriam for being our panelists for this evening's session and for you know, responding so well to those questions. And a very special thank you to everybody who attended the webinar and who contributed to the discussion to the chat um, in this evening's session. And finally, a big thank you to those behind the scenes who helped to make sure that everything worked so smoothly tonight. So to Anne and Clara and Kitty and Mary, a very big thank you. Um, and just to finish off, we hope that the webinar has been interesting and inspiring for many of you. And we hope that you may have found material um, to inform your practice um, and even maybe to encourage you to take on some research in this very under-researched area and very much needed area to be researched. So just once more, thank you very much to everybody for taking part. And I don't know if I hand over to somebody else at this point. Noreen, do you want to? 
Not at all, Anne-Marie. It's, it's, um, it's lovely to have seen so many people still here to hear the, the um, questions and to see the comments and to get two really ex excellent speakers who spoke so clearly and so with such full understanding of child minding. I think that's really what was important and what's come across. And Bernadette, I, I, I'm, I was really glad that you took the opportunity for a sort of call to arms, that one <laughs> of the ways to influence um, yes. policymakers is to get the language out there and to keep that to the fore. So mm. I hope there are many, many more conversations and any way that we can help in RECIC or in any other way, I'd be only too pleased. And Holly and Miriam, you know, I may be in touch about ideas for further research as well. And thank you, Anne-Marie, for coordinating everything. So good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Very best. Thank Bye you. now.